Great. Let me welcome you all first. Welcome to another episode of Coffee and Conversations. This is an occasional series that we're running. I think this is the third one that we've done from the collection. I think there have been several that were other staff members. This is a time for staff at OJMCHE to, um, to reach out and, and show you what we're doing. Um, and since, since we're, we're not doing much in the collection right now, Alicia and I have decided to show you some objects that, that don't get a lot of visibility, that things that, that are in storage and you're, this is your little behind the scenes peek. I am Anne Levant Prahl. I'm the curator of the collection at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. And this is Alicia Babstein. She is our archivist. And uh, we're, we're broadcasting to you from separate rooms, maintaining social distance. Um, ordinarily, we get to both be in front of that beautiful window and, um, and working from our office. So um, I'm going to start out just with a quick a uh, taster of the kinds of things that we're showing you. I chose, since I work with the collection, which is the three-dimensional part of the collection, sometimes two-dimensional, um, the, the non-archival part of the collection, um, I tried to choose things from our uh, different areas of collection. We have some areas of special interest, our special collections within the museum one is our business collection where we collect the um, artifacts and archives of Oregon Jewish owned businesses. Um, one is our, our immigration story. We, we certainly have lots of personal um, material from people's immigration story from their families. Um, uh, we have a fine arts collection and well, we're gonna, uh, let's get to it. The, the first object I want to show you is this. This is a shaving cup and you can't see it because it's faded, but it says um, Jakob Bodner on it, 1905, which is the year that Jacob Bodner immigrated to, um, to, uh, or to, to the United States and then to Oregon from there. Um, and this, he was, not, he was not alone in this. This is a set of straight edge razor and shaving cup that his relative met him at Ellis Island with. And, and the words that he quotes are that the very first thing you have to do is, is take off your beard and become a real American. So this was one of the, one of the, the steps toward assimilating that happened right away. And we have other stories too of people who were told first thing, First thing you do when you step off that boat is shave off your beard. Um, and we're delighted to have his story and his, we have two of his beautiful razors. Um, all right, now I'm going to turn this over to Alicia and she'll start in on the, on the archival objects. Um, okay, hi friends. Um, just a reminder, if anyone has questions, go ahead and put them in that Q&A section. Um, if we, we should have time at the end, uh, so we can be able to get to those for folks. Um, so like Anne said, I'm gonna talk about some of the, my favorite things from the archives part of the collection. Um, so for those of you who don't already know, I know I've talked about him before, um, Arthur Schick is one of my favorite artists featured here in our collection. Um, so he was born in Poland um, in 1894, and he's widely known now, at least, for his beautiful illustrations and illuminations of Jewish themes and history, <clears throat> as well as his many political cartoons and caricatures that he created during World War II. Um, so let me share my screen again. I'm handling the tech part of it, so just bear with me. It will take one second every time I have to do it. So um, this is the first book we have in the collection. I've talked about this a little bit before. You can find that um, on our website, but I will talk about it briefly here today as well. Um, so the first book that I wanna talk about is uh, Ink and Blood, and it's a book of exceptionally detailed drawings caricaturing the um, Axis leaders during World War II. 
Uh, and you can see in the book, um, in these drawings here, uh, hopefully you can see them if my screen's working correctly, um, his particularly unique style, uh, he was very interested and a big fan of comics and cartoons. And he also took his, uh, his artistic skill came from um, the medieval illuminations uh, artists. So you can really see it kind of combined here. So, um, oh, excuse me. Oh man, there we go. Um, so Schick lived in London in 1939 when Germany invaded Poland um, and in an effort to sway American public opinion against the Nazis, the British authorities asked him to head to New York City. Um, he arrived there in 1940. So their goal was that he would become unofficially uh, the leading propagandist for the Allied powers. Um, they wanted him to produce and disseminate a steady stream of anti-Nazi cartoons and caricatures for major US publications. Uh, he was overwhelmingly successful. U.S. publications that published his work included Time Magazine, Collier's, Esquire, The New York Times, The New York Post, and The Chicago Sun. Um, and throughout the war years, uh, Schick's work really was just everywhere. On um, this next one here, I cheated a little. These technically aren't in our collection. I just wanted you to see some of his, some of the rest of his work. These are not included in the book, Ink and Blood. Um, but his work was featured, for example, um, on the cover of Collier's. Uh, he was on there eight times. Um, the White House had 38 of his pieces hanging in the, the White House at that time. The New York Post published more than 100 of his cartoons. You could take a walk through the streets of New York and see his work on billboards, in subways. Um, it even was on the covers of um, the Manhattan and Brooklyn phone books. Um, so I definitely recommend you go look more into the cartoons. I think that they're really, the caricatures, they're really something to, to look at. Um, the next thing that we have in the collection of Arthur Schick's is his Haggadah. Um, and he's probably best known for the Haggadah. For those of you who are familiar with him, you've probably discovered him through the Haggadah. Um, so after several years of work, this was first finally published in 1940. Um, and this Haggadah is really beautiful. It's just stunning. Uh, the Times of London even said that it was worthy to be placed among the most beautiful of books that the hand of man had ever produced. Um, and an interesting bit of trivia about it, uh, when it was first published, it was the most expensive book on the market in the world at the time, um, with each of the 250 limited edition copies selling for just over 500 US dollars. Um, so what you might not know, and some of you probably do know, um, <clears throat> is when he first created it, he included very explicit connections between the Egyptians and the Nazis. Um, and he embedded those throughout that original version that he created in the mid thirties. Um, you would have seen Egyptians, which you can see in the middle here with armbands and those would have had swastikas on them. And the two snakes, which are also throughout the entire text would have had swastikas down their backs. Um, but because of censorship and he really wanted to get it published, he spent a few years, they asked him to paint over all of those Nazi emblems so that it was more uh, neutral, I guess. Um, but if you look closely, you can still see uh, pretty clear connections to Hitler at the very least um, in there and it's in the Wicked Sun. So if you look at his mustache, uh, it's a very Hitler-like mustache. Um, and again, there's a lot more I could say about the Haggadah, but I wanna make sure we have time for questions at the end and just kind of giving you a glimpse of stuff here. Um, and finally, we have Schick's Illuminated Israeli Declaration of Independence. So like I said earlier, Schick arrived in the US uh, in late 1940. So nearly after, after nearly eight years of waiting for American citizenship, which he was finally granted on May 22nd, 1948, um, or, well, he wait, so he waited nearly eight years for that citizenship. Um, and by all accounts, I mean, Schick loved the US. It had been a dream of his to become a citizen here. Um, it really meant the world to him. And interestingly, uh, he, everyone expected him to be pretty excited about getting that uh, citizenship, but he was kind of uh, underwhelmed. Uh, and it's because eight days earlier, on May 14th of the same year, Israel had been declared a state. Um, and uh, in later years when his wife would tell the story of this, um, she would say that he was listening to it on the radio and he just burst into tears. She said it was the happiest day of his life. Um, 
So upon hearing about the establishment of the State of Israel, he asked the Israeli government if he could, um, he asked for permission to illustrate the, the new declaration. Uh, he told them, he said, I am but a Jew praying in art. If I, have, if I have succeeded in any measure, if I have gained the power of reception among the elite of the world, then I owe it all to the teachings, traditions, and eternal vision of my people. And of course they agreed. Um, and Schick had considered himself a Zionist since his teen years, um, and he'd always been drawn to the Torah. Um, and you can really see that in the, in the imagery in this, in this uh, piece here. You can see Stars of David. Um, he included texts and verses from the Torah and the Talmud. Um, there are famous biblical characters in there, including Moses and Aaron. Um, and then the more modern characters on the sides there, you can see um, a Jewish farmer. And you can see an IDF soldier uh, bearing a flag in one hand and a rifle in the other. Um, and just another quick bit of trivia, because I love trivia. Um, he also created an illuminated rendition of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, um, which was unveiled in Connecticut on July 4th, 1950. Um, it was actually one of the last pieces he did before he passed away in, this, in September of 1951. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and head back to Anne, see what she has to say now. Back again. Thanks, Alicia. Um, all right, the next thing I want to, to show you comes with a story. And this is too wonderful for words. This is actually a blow up of a calling card that young Milt Mar Margulis um, handed out during his 1914 campaign to become Portland's boy mayor. And the, the, it, it's a wonderful period in Portland history. Portland, like, like so many other cities um, at that time, had newsboys out on the street selling newspapers. And they were a problem. They were always in trouble with the law. They were drinking. They were gambling. They were young men, young men without enough to do. And the progressives in the city got it in their heads that what the newsboys needed was a rec center, a, a home of their own, because San Francisco had recently done the same thing and started a rec center for the boys, um, the newsboys there, and it was proving to be a good thing. So without, without any money for it, they invented the boy mayor system, and um, it was highly, highly publicized. It started in 1910 and um, all over the newspaper um, are accounts of the race that was hotly contested for one penny a vote. You could vote for your favorite newsboy and he could become boy mayor. And um, in that first first election in 1910, they sold 150,000 votes and they got a they got a, a rec center for the newsboys where they um let's see by 1914 they had um a boy police force of 50 newsboys who were out policing the streets they kind of did a little turnaround and became a little more law abiding um and they had movie nights at the um at the rec center where they watched Sherlock Holmes movies and and um, defended them as this this was how the the fifty boy police force was going to learn um, crime solving tactics. Um, so I I don't believe that Mill Margulies won in 1914. And 1914 was the last year. It was just a four year project of boy mayors. And um, you can see his. I don't know if you can see Milt's platform is a fireman's pension fund more playgrounds for children, free admission to Oaks Park, which was Portland's amusement park, for all school children, and a South Portland bridge, and the beautifying of Portland. So vote for me and I will make good. Um, we also have the, the, the calling card itself, but I do love that he, it, it was blown up to poster sized. All right, Alicia. Back to you. All right. Let me pull up uh, my stuff here. All right. So the next thing I want to show you are some of the various ledgers that we have in the collection. 
You've probably seen a few of the smaller ones that we have on exhibit, such as Ben Selling's account ledger of who he gifted money to in the late 1920s all the way through the early depression years. Um, we'll look at that today, as well as others that are all either too big or too fragile, or maybe both to exhibit. And of course, when you exhibit them, they're a little static anyhow, uh, and you can only really have them open to a single page. And it's usually a center page uh, so that we can keep the weight distributed evenly or wherever the spine may already be cracked so we don't do any extra damage to one of these ledgers. Um, these are really the sorts of objects that lend themselves well to a virtual or digital exhibit. Um, I think with the right time and attention, we could probably put something pretty dynamic together. For today, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about a few of them and just show you the photos via um, PowerPoint here. Um, so the first one we have is um, Congregation Beth Israel Cemetery Ledger. So it's a little hard to tell in the photo, but this one's about two feet uh, tall and a foot and a half wide, and it easily weighs 10 or so pounds, which is pretty heavy for a book. Um, it's really something. And we actually use this in reference questions quite frequently. So for example, a person might call to say that their grandparents, Jane and John Smith, are buried in CBI Cemetery, as well as an aunt or an uncle. They may know that their family has a family plot, three spaces of which are filled, and two that are empty. So in these instances, the researcher usually knows which block and section the family has, uh, say block eight, section one. And they want to find out who owns the empty plots. They want to know if they belong to the family or not. And my first stop is always this ledger. Um, it's the most accessible and most reliable record of the burial plots. Um, it's uh, for anyone who you can see here, uh, the names and the dates, of, you can see one of the plot sections at the end of this little slide here. But, um, you know, we often come across these lists in our collection of birth and death dates for various membership rosters. And for anyone who has um, looked through those or worked with those, um, I know some of my volunteers are listening today and I've asked several of them to do this. Uh, you get a lot of conflicting information because people are working from memory um, or guessing. Um, and these records here are really uh, accurate. Um, here's one of the sec block and section pages that, that make it easy for us to find out who is where. Um, and we're actually working on getting this, uh, these scanned um, and perhaps transcribed so that we can be able to search through them faster and we can pr actually preserve the ledger so that we don't have to handle it as much. Um, and then this next one that I want to talk about is the, this holds the minutes for the early years of Congregation Ahavai Shalom. So it begins in the late 1800s and contains uh, meeting notes up through about 1904 or 1905. Um, so this one is about a foot and a half tall and just under a foot wide, again, big, and it's relatively heavy. Uh, it's in, you can't tell from the outside here, but it is in better shape than the cemetery ledger, ledger uh, but it is still fragile. Uh, for this one, at least almost all of the pages are still adhered to the binding. Uh, but the more it gets open, the more it will degrade. So again, working on transcribing and scanning this ledger as well. Um, so there are a lot of things I love about these books, uh, ranging from the usually beautiful penmanship that we don't really see as much today, of course, um, all the way up to the level of detail they usually kept. Uh, so at one meeting in 1898, the secretary actually recorded the contents of a letter that was read aloud at um, one of their meetings from a recent bar mitzvah. And you can see that on the right of my screen, it might be on your left. Um, and the bar mitzvah was thanking the congregation for the gift of a watch. His father was actually Robert Abrahamson, um, who had served as the chazan of the congregation since 1887. Um, and the letter is really just sweet and I really enjoy that they recorded it here. Um, and again, many ledgers like this are really valuable for research. You know, like almost any tidbit of uh, history of a congregation can be found in these records, especially the early ones. Uh, for example, if we wanted to know who was president in 1889 or the date the congregation moved or maybe merged with another, uh, dates that rabbis came and went, names of um, committees and officers of those committees, these sorts of um, ledgers are usually our best bet. So the next one here is Ben Selling's charitable donation ledger. And again, this one is usually on exhibit. Um, if you open one of the drawers, you can often see it. Um, 
So this goes from 1927 up through January 1931. Um, ben Selling actually died on January 15th, 1931. And there are three entries in here for January of 31. So he was gifting money up until the very end of his life. Um, so he was born in 1852. He moved to Portland with his family when he was 10. He worked for his father for a short time before opening a, a clothier store, which was at South, uh, South, yeah, Southwest Morrison and Fourth. He was elected president of the Oregon Senate. Uh, he was a speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives. Um, he worked with uh, his friend Sig Sichel for the IRO, which was the Industrial uh, Removal Office, which was an organization that helped Jewish, Jewish immigrants move from overcrowded cities on the East Coast and settle in the less than less crowded cities of the West Coast. Um, so Selling was very active in Portland's Jewish community, especially the charitable organizations such as Hebrew Benevolent Association, the Jewish Relief Society, the Neighborhood, the Neighborhood House. Um, and by all accounts, Ben Selling lived quite modestly. Um, historian Steve Lowenstein called Selling the preeminent Jewish philanthropist of his life. And another um, historian, Kim Mark McCall, uh, made a related point saying, Ben Selling probably gave away more money in proportion to his income than any other Oregon citizen since the state was founded. Um, and as you can see from the entries here, most of what is in this journal are charitable contributions made to local um, Portland community members. Um, one of my favorite, two of my favorite entries really are here on the right. Um, on January 17th, uh, 1929, he gave $5 to a one-legged man. Um, and on the 30th of the same month, he gave $10 to a little old lady's mother. Now, sure, it's hard not to chuckle at those entries, but I think it shows that he really gave money to anyone that needed it, um, even if he didn't know who they were. Um, and finally, uh, we have the business ledger of Isaac A. Boskowitz's dry goods store in Somerville, Oregon. This one's dated 1886 to 1887. Uh, Somerville is out in Union County. It's about an hour from Baker City. So this ledger is much smaller and lighter, um, and it's only a, a year's worth of data. Uh, but again, it's still fragile, so we just keep it back here in the archives. Um, so these ledgers can also be wells of information. Uh, in the case, uh, in this case, I think it's a great insight into how a dry goods store ran. I think most of us today don't have really a sense of what that was like. You know, what did they sell? How often did customers come in? Um, who were their customers? Um, how much did the goods cost? And how far did travel folks travel to come to a store like this, especially one that was so remote? Um, uh, and for our purposes, it's also really valuable uh, for, to, you know, our mission is to sort of document the, the Jewish experience in all of Oregon. And this is one of those that really shows us they really were, our community was everywhere. It wasn't just in the bigger cities. Um, so again, a real wealth of information here. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to Anne now. Thank you. I have Ben Selling's little book right here that is going back on exhibit once we're done. but. Um, I had to point out our this 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 little ledger is our museum director's favorite thing in the museum. Um, she loves to to talk about Ben in in specific uh, Ben in general and this little book in specific. The last entry on on January nineteen twenty nine is five dollars, and he has written coat for a poor girl. So I think that what happened was people came into his clothing store and beg. people came in and said, this is, I need this. And he, and he gave them what they needed. He was a good guy. So business ledgers are part of that. I was telling you about our special collection in Jewish owned businesses. Oh, wait, I'm going to, I can't remember what I'm doing next. I'm not doing, I'm not doing businesses yet. I'm doing minor way. Right. Yes. Um, all right. So we're going to leave business for a moment and we're going to go to fine art where we have um, in the collection um, the photography of three Portland artists who were all heavily influenced by and good personal friends with Minor White. This is a photograph of Minor White taken by one of those three um, men in um in i think this is 1961 um that's minor white on the left and he's out in the country with a small group of oregon professionals who all made their their livings doing other things 
um, but all of them very accomplished amateur photographers. They were all part of the Portland Camera Club at the time, but they felt kind of outside of the, the camera club's scope because they were interested in fine art. They were interested in self-expression and, um, and in the things that Minor White had to offer. Uh, it was not possible really to make a living as a, as a fine arts photographer um, in, the, in the late 40s and 50s when they were when they were coming into photography, unless you were a superstar. And Minor was one of those superstars. You might know his name. He was, he was um, at the Rochester Institute of Technology, I dad, and, um, and at MIT, I believe. And he was one, he came west several times. He had a long, long relationship with Oregon. The first time he came out, it was as one of the WPA um, artists and he came for for several years in 1949 I think 49 um, and did some exquisite photographs of Portland that I if you're a Portlander perhaps before before we closed down you had a chance to see the show of his work at the um, Portland Art Museum last year um, he came in 1959 and these these people asked him to do a workshop and he did a week-long workshop with them and they were so excited by what he had to say and what they could do with their art that it became an annual thing and every summer minor came back for years and years he um he came back and did uh, a long workshop with these men and so i wanted to show you some of this is the work of jerry robinson who was a local lawyer an Oregon Jew. And this piece is his as well that I thought I would show because it really exemplifies the influence that Minor White had, this detailed look at nature and being being inspired by the natural surroundings and the the play of light and dark. This is the this is um Driftwood at the Oregon coast. Uh, one of the other artists who was part of that club was Arnold Rustin. This is not a picture of Arnold Rustin. This is a picture that Arnold Rustin took. We have, I think we have five or six pieces of Arnold Rustin's in the collection and they are all fabulous. This is Swiss old man. Um, and Arnold was a, a dentist in town and um, all of these men were friends with each other and friends with, with Minor as well throughout their lives. Okay, next one. Um, this is a photo by Bill Galen, and he is photographing Frederick Littman, another Oregon Jew. And Frederick Littman, um, in, this, in this photo, he's working on a study for a much larger piece. Um, and he also did, he, he did so much work in Portland, but he was hired to make the um, the ark doors for Congregation Beth Israel's synagogue when they renovated the Bima and their synagogue. You don't happen to remember the year, do you, Alicia? I don't remember the year. Uh, off the top of my head, I, 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 it was the late 70s, early 80s, I think. Yeah, but um, this is the photograph that, that Bill Galen, who was a local doctor and very talented doctor and very talented photographer, this is the, the piece that he that he did for the synagogue. Um, you okay? I'm going to stop because they're wonderful. Oh, you go on, Alicia. Okay. <laughs> um. So the last thing. Oops. Excuse me. Again, technology. Sorry about that. Uh. Let's see. Uh, the last thing that I want to show you um, is our, it's in our collection, it's the um, CBI Golden Book, Congregation Beth Israel's Golden Book. So let me just pull that up for you. Uh -huh. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so uh, I'm showing you this on honestly, uh, just because I think it's beautiful. It's one of my favorite things in the collection. Um, 
So I know I've already talked about the cemetery ledger, but here I'll just give you a little bit of a history for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, congregation Beth Israel is the oldest congregation here in Oregon. Um, their first meeting was attended by only eight people, um, and that took place in 1858. By the following month, 21 people had officially become members, and they um, attended the first of many weekly services that were held in Burke's Hall, which was a loft um, above a blacksmith uh, shop and a stable um, at First and Morrison. Um, and in 1859, the year that Oregon became a state, the congregation decided to build its first um, synagogue. So the purposes of this book uh, was to record the history of the congregation from its inception. Uh, in 1858 up through 1889 uh, when the book was finished, which also corresponded with the construction of their second building. Um, so this was commissioned in 1887 uh, by the congregation and a committee um, headed by Saul Hirsch and David Solis Cohen was set up to carry out the project. It actually took them two years to gather all of the information that they needed and then to actually create the, the book, which uh, I think you can sort of see why the entire thing looks like this with the the very um, florid penmanship, lots of embellishment, the gold uh, leaf inlay there, uh, which is on nearly almost every page. Uh, it's really just beautiful. Um, and you can see on the edge here, hopefully you can see that I tried to kind of blow it up a little bit, the, the gold on the edge of the pages. When you see it in person, it's really just beautiful and it's in this sort of um, gold velvet box. Uh, it's really just lovely. Um, and similar, again, to the ledgers I was showing you above, the research value of this book really is fabulous. Um, there's the simple fact that the folks who created it were um, all involved or closely uh, connected to the founding of the congregation and the very early years. Uh, so rather than being written by a historian much later, most of what's in this book um, is firsthand knowledge. Uh, and that's not entirely uh, unusual, of course. Um, it's just always nice to have such a reliable reference source. Um, so again, this is just a very beautiful book. Uh, and that's, I think that's all I'll say about it. You can ask me questions if you have extra questions. Um, I will give it back to Anne. Oh, you muted yourself, Anne. What happened? Wait, wait, wait. Stop talking. Muted myself. Oh, how come? Um, so that it wouldn't bounce back. Okay, I'm back. Sorry. Where's the mouse? Oh, you have it over there. Uh -huh. um, don't go to the to the PowerPoint just yet. Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, I want. I, I. I. This is what I started to show you just a minute ago because. It, it goes well with the rest of our business collection. This is something that never gets out of, of storage and it really should because look how awesome it is. This is this fabulous pith helmet with radio dial and um, antenna and inside um, the, full, the, the, the full radio. This is a portable radio. Um, and the Oregon Jew responsible for this, his name is Victor Hoflick. And Victor didn't, didn't stay in Oregon long, unfortunately. He left his, his wife and daughter, wife and five-year-old daughter, um, in the 30s to go off and make his fortune in New York. And the fortune that he made was in a company called Merrymakers, also called Merrillay. And they made party hats and and um, paper lays and later plastic lays for parties, all the party goods that you could want. And in 1949, Victor got it in his head that what the world really needed was a portable radio you could wear on your head. And this is five years before pocket transistor radios came out. So he was pretty, he was pretty um, in front of the curve. But this was full tube radio that had all the, all the tubes were inside it. The antenna was visible. Um, there were transistors, I think, in 1949, but they were, they were not in private use yet. They were still in, in laboratories and experiments. Want to show the picture now, Alicia? Yep. 
um, he launched a huge marketing campaign and here on the cover of Radio Electronics is a very, very young Hope Lang, she, a little teenage Hope Lang there, demonstrating that you can see the antenna in the back. And I have it, I, I can show you our antenna that is here and the tubes sticking out. Um, and it was evidently highly, highly popular for about 15 minutes after 1949. Um, in the it, it, the records that I've read said sales were amazing. I think it only sold for for about four or five years and then and then the pocket transistor radio sort of made it made it even more ridiculous than it already was. So um, I just think it's awesome that we have that we have this in our collection and I wish that we had more occasion to to exhibit something like this. Um, all right, so I, I don't know, Gail, if you want to weigh in with any questions. Oh, I wanted to remind everybody that we have done other shows and we've recorded them all. So if you go to our website, which is ojmche.org, um, you, can, you can see some of the other videos that we've done. And we're gonna keep doing it as long as we're all, as long as we're all trapped. Alicia and I don't get to talk to the public enough when it's not quarantine so we're happy we're happy to get to show you what we have if you came to the museum you wouldn't get to see this unless unless we were doing a special project so we're delighted to get to show you these things okay. that's great yep yeah, that's great thanks ann and alicia and yes we have some questions oh, awesome. um, the first just very quickly um let's go back to the first items you showed ann was it jacob bodner's the cup in the, okay, and is it Jacob, J-A-C-O-B? J-A-C-O-B. Okay, super. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a couple George of- Bodner's father. Okay. A couple questions pertaining to um, Arthur Schick's work. Um, so, Let's see, Haley Brown is asking, um, do you happen to have any of his anti-KKK art in the archival material? Um, she's thinking the most prominent example she could think of was his piece, Do Not Forgive Them, O oh Lord, for they do know what they do. Yes, yeah, so we don't have that piece in the collection. That is a piece, um, there is a African-American man in the front of the piece and he has a noose around his neck and his hands are tied behind his back and there are three Clan members approaching from behind and Schick's text in the corner says exactly what she said that do not forgive them for they do know what they do. Um, and that is not in our collection. No. Okay. All right. Um, and again, so pertaining to a special collection such as Arthur Schick's work, would we ever consider having that travel and be exhibited in another museum or organization? No, uh, because the things that we have of his, we have the, the, the declaration, the Haggadah, and the book Ink and Blood. It's not a large collection. Um, it, the, the pieces are not all separate, like in the book, for example. It's just the one book. So I'm not sure that we would travel those items. Um, I, I can't really see it. I do know that the Magnus collection down in Berkeley has hundreds of his pieces um, that donation was made to them some years ago so that would be a good place to look for an exhibit if you are interested in more of his work okay uh two questions that are somewhat related um to our collection and if people are interested in making a donation so could you just speak briefly about where how all these fabulous items have come to be in Ojemcha's collection? And if someone has something special at home that they think maybe the museum would be interested in, what should they do? Wow, that sounds like a question that came right from our director. <laughs> um, um, we, have, we have a form on the website that you, can, that you can get from the website that asks you to tell us a little bit about, um, about what you have to, op to offer. Alternatively, you can always call and leave us a message. We answer all of our messages or email us. Um, and if it's a large archival collection, then um, Alicia and sometimes, sometimes both of us usually go to your home and, and go through the collection with you to determine which, you know, how much of it and what, what from it belongs 
in our collection. The archivists in Oregon are, are very cooperative with each other and we make a big effort to make sure that the right things are in the right repository. So um, we each have our own um, areas of collection that we're doing and we do, we collect, specifically we collect um, the Oregon, the, the Jewish experience in Oregon, um, and then also the, the, the fine art aspect is, is an additional part to that. And, um, and now we also collect stories of, of Holocaust and genocide as well. So we, we want to make sure that things that are being offered are going to be used in this collection, that, that people know that this is the place to come and get them. So we want to make sure of that. And it's the same with objects. Um, for fine art, we have a, an acquisitions committee that meets quarterly. So um, we would ask you to bring in your pieces of fine art, of sculpture or paintings or photography, drawings, um, so that the committee can have them in person to discuss them. And um, objects like this, well, we don't even need to think about it. Of course we want it. Um, if it. If it has something to say about the Jewish experience in Oregon, then, um, then we can talk. Okay. And definitely business things, personal items. All right. Call us, we'll talk. Okay, um, so, uh, so a couple of questions that sort of follow up what you were just sharing, Anne. Uh, so I think there, people are interested in one, how many artifacts or items are in the collection and the archives overall? So I think people could have an idea of the scope of our collection. And then also, how often are um, artifacts um, cycled through our exhibitions? So how often like, would people come and see something new that hadn't been on exhibit before? Wow, um, I have a really bad memory for numbers. I can't even speculate. Judy might know, Alicia might know. I don't know how, how many- How many items. artifacts? How many artifacts in the collection? Mm -hmm. About 9,000. About nine, there you go. About I, said, I think 000. that's right, I can look it up. That sounds like the right number. Um, yeah, it's more interesting to me to know how many in each of our special areas, like how many of those are business related, how many of them are mm -hmm. club and synagogue related and um, we have we have some tremendously good stuff here. Um, okay. What was the second part of that question? Um, how how often do we oh. update our ex our exhibitions of our permanent well, of we items in our collection? Well, we the Oregon Jewish Stories exhibit as one of our three core exhibits in the museum when we opened to the public in 2017, and we have changed out um about a third of it we have changed out twice so not very often um i think things stay up for at least a year um and if they're the only object we have that tells the story that we're trying to tell then we are not going to take it down um uh, but um but we try and get things out there that haven't been out before um some of the things are never coming down um because, because they are they're unique in in their ability to tell a story. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I think I'm trying to summarize some of the questions. I think I have two more for you. Um, one, uh, the Declaration of Independence that you shared, Alicia. What what is the size of that piece? I will uh, get it for you. Yeah, the, it's framed. Um, the actual size is probably two feet by two feet or a foot and a half by a foot and a half. The actual mm -hmm. piece itself. This big. What's that? It's this big. Yeah, I know it's hard to tell there. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good size. Um, and actually, I think, you know, I, I, again, like I said, I really like trivia. So um, I'll say that even a piece that intricate um, and the declaration of, uh, in, that he did for the U.S. and um, a single piece in the Haggadah, it never took him more than about a week to complete some of his, even the most intricate of his work, which I always find fascinating. You look at it and you think, man, that had to have taken months. Um, 
And he didn't use a magnifying glass. Um, he did have a magnifying glass on his desk, according to friends, um, that he allowed visitors to use in order to look more closely at his work. But um, no one that I have never uh, heard record of him using a magnifying glass to actually produce any of his work, which I always find fascinating. He must have had good eyes. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was perfect, Alicia, because you answered the second part of the question that I was going to ask you, which had to do with how long um, it typically took, if we knew how long it took um, Arthur Schick to complete one of his works. Um, right. Okay. And so the last question, the Haggadah that... Uh -huh we shared and that is we own that that is part of our collection correct it is we actually have two of that um Haggadah that is it's uh, silver plated on the on the um the cover and we have two of those um and can you flip that one over to the other side so the other one we have actually has the turquoise um jewel in it. Stone. That yeah exactly stone. um so we have the two of those. They, we do they we do own those in the collection. Yes. I like having two because then when we have them have them on exhibit, we can show the beautiful silver work as well as one of the inside illustrations. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, one last let one last question, and this is it. I promise. Um, so under under normal circumstances and days that are not COVID related, um, are people able to access the archives at the museum? Um, under and normal. yes. If someone want if someone had the need to come and uh, do some research, what should they do? Now or you mean in normal times? In normal times. <laughs> they were just all the time. Yeah, they just have to reach it's by appointment only. So they just would reach out to us and ask um, if we if they can, you know, pick a time to come in and we would pull the like the material out that they might want to look at. Um, we're actually it's going to be a long project, but we're working on trying to get as much of our collection as possible digitized and finding aids up on the website so that folks could actually get a sense of what we have. Um, to know if they wanted to come in and do research here in the first place. Um, not that we don't want people coming to us, um, but if we can't help them, it'd be nice. They could just, we could maybe direct them someplace else, but that's a project that's moving into the future, but um, yeah. Okay, thank you. That, uh, that brings us to the end of our questions. Well, I wanna thank you all for being here. And I think our next, is our next one on the 24th? Have we decided? I don't know if we have a date yet. Uh, yeah, well, we'll it, it might sure be. We get it out to you when we, when we do this again. If you have suggestions for things that you would particularly like to see or have us talk about, we would love to do it. I would really like to take out um, pieces from our textile collection. We have a huge textile collection. Um, they're just difficult to hold up and show you and and we don't have many of them photographed so i'll have to find our smaller textiles and and show you some of those next time okay wonderful okay well, thank, thank you thank yeah, you thank both you everyone for attending too this has been really fun it's nice to see some familiar names and just have uh be able to share ourselves and our stuff with our friends and community Thanks for hosting okay. us, Gail. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye.